This is the Intellectual Investor Podcast. Special episode, The Disciplined Investor Podcast with Vitaly Katzenelson. For more episodes, go to investor.fm. Or to read this article instead, head to contrarianedge.com. The Disciplined Investor Podcast with Vitaly Katzenelson. In this podcast with the disciplined investor, Vitaly touches on a wide variety of topics, particularly pertaining to how to invest in inflation, historical stock returns, his market outlook going forward, and the link between interest rates and discount rates for assets like stocks. Enjoy. This week, we have a guest, Vitaly Katzenelson, and he writes a wonderful, wonderful, just a barrage of information, The Contrarian Edge. He's with imausa.com, as you can find him there. Um, Vitaly has been on before. I wanted to talk to him because he has a very clear mind, a clear head. And before we get Vitaly, I want to say something to you, okay? Let's see if I got this. Добро пожаловать на шоу. Спасибо. Welcome to the show. All right. Did I say, right. did I get it right? Yeah, you got it right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Welcome to the show in Russian. Anyway, Vitaly, Vitaly, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing great. I, you know, I, as you and I talked, I, you know, my whole family went through the little episode of COVID, mm. you know, and actually no, it wasn't just my family. It just wasn't my direct family, my extended family as well. And all of us were vaccinated. And therefore, because of that, I would say, that was a very mild experience. It's right. just, it's basically, we had colds that were much worse than that. Again, I'm not, I'm not downplaying COVID. I'm just, over, I guess I want to emphasize the kind of the value. But Vitaly, it was, it, was, it was a mild physical experience, but tell me psychologically what it was like. Oh, psychologically, I, you know, I basically had to stay in the basement of my house. Yeah. For, you know, and that's, you know, it's, just, it's where you should be anyway, buddy. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, there were probably some upsides there as well. So that's fine. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about the stock market, which is obviously has more than a, the COVID flu. It's yeah. obviously gotten you know fed up with the Fed, and um, you know it's interesting because I want to get your thoughts on the initial market reaction, which changed so dramatically in January. The thing is that. People were very accustomed, and I want to put words in your mouth, but I want to start you off, and then you can go from there, okay? People are very accustomed to, hey, you know, we just take money, we put it into this thing called the stock market, into this stock that I don't know what it is, or maybe this this, this cryptocurrency that, well, looks fancy, and it was very rewarding. And it was interesting because I want to start off with this. You tweeted, which you had a very interesting discussion, uh, some insights from Seth Klarman. You said... And it was just yesterday, you said market participants with less than 12 years of experience have never been burned and have no idea how hot the stove can get. And this has exacerbated moral hazard by masking the connection between real world events and the value of their portfolios. And without relevant recent experience, standards become lax and investors drop their guard. And finally, greater risk is willingly occur, incurred and regularly misperceived, often without adequate compensation or any effort at mitigation. So take it from there. Yeah, there are so many things I can say about this. Let me start with the kind of, uh, I uh, on Twitter, there's, a, you know, there's this thing called spaces. And so you can go and, you know, in a, it's almost like a clubhouse for Twitter kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I was there in the AMC apes space. And there was one woman, oh, she said, she, I, I was just there to listen, just to understand, kind of, I wanted to understand these people because this is a very different type of thinking. Yeah. Uh, oh, and there's this, but the, one woman said something that's really stuck with me because that really sums up what a lot of people think about investing, or at least like a segment of the market. I shouldn't say a lot, a segment of the market thinks about you know, investing. She said, I bought the stock. I go to the movies. I talk about AMC all the time. And the stock is still going down. I did not realize investing is going to be so difficult. <laughs> that, and, okay. And so that it kind of, you know, because, and that sums up, you know, you know kind of uh, like a, um, the attitude people bring to. But didn't uh, Peter, wait, wait, didn't Peter Lynch do this? Wasn't Peter Lynch all about buy what you know, and that's what she did. So what's the problem? 
Well, it's because it also matters how much you pay for it. <laughs> yeah, okay. The, the, the price matters, the fundamentals matter, right? Just because, no, no, but what she, she, what she was trying to say is that she kept buying tickets to go to see movies and that, and this, ah, she thought that, ah, <laughs> that so, I think that's what she meant. So I buy Nike stock and then I go on Amazon or direct to Nike.com and I buy 20 pairs of shoes. I don't understand why the stock price went down. Exactly. Ah. exactly okay. No, but I think in all seriousness, um, and I think uh, Seth Klarman, who is brilliant, he makes a great point. Like if you look, and I wrote about this too, if you look over the last 20 or 30 years, we lived in an environment where interest rates have declined consistently, especially the last 20 years, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and declining interest rates, basically, uh, if you own bonds, you always made money over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, that just almost became... Uh, Something you just well you make money you buy bonds you make yeah, a little it was money an expect, it was a it was an inbred expectation. Yes, the problem is what and this is very important to understand, is that, in, especially in financial assets, when the price goes up because of um, you're paying more for less and which is basically price earnings goes up, right? Not because something earns more money, but because just price earnings goes up then the expected return goes down. In other words, just I want you to think about, I'm going to give you, I wrote two books about this subject. And, I, and this is very important to understand if you're an equity investor. Okay. Okay, think about this. And I'm going to simplify the math a little bit, a little bit just to make it simple. Okay, over the last 100 years, the stocks on average made 10% a year. Mm -hmm. The 10% was made for two reasons. Because Economy grew about 6% a year on nominal basis, roughly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and investors collected dividends. I mean, I'm sorry. So the stock prices went up 6% a year. And the economy so was going on. Things were good. Stock price went up. And now dividends, too. And, and dividends added another 4%. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a very long period of time, 100 years. It doesn't mean that, first of all, it means it's an average number. There were years where the stocks were up 20%. There were years that went down 5%, whatever. On average, that was the number. So in other words, the reason stocks, again, this is important to understand, the reason stocks made 10% a year because earnings growth and dividends, okay? Mm -hmm. the, but there was an X factor over any period of time, and the X factor was priced earnings. When they, they during the periods of time, this, so by the, well, one last thing before I go get to priced earnings, one thing that was very stable over the last 100 plus years is the real G, uh, economic growth uh, before inflation. In other words, economy grew about 3% a year, 3% uh, a year, like a clock, year after year after year. There were small interruptions, but they were very small. Okay. The, like, you know, the, you, you have high inflation, low inflation, but the 3% real growth was like almost like a constant. Mm -hmm. Now, okay. So inter price earnings. Price to earnings was the variable that, that during some periods of time made returns of stocks higher and then made them lower. So again, remember 6% economic growth. And then suddenly when the price to earnings goes up, you know, goes up, then instead of making 6% a year on stocks, I'm just talking about st stock price, uh, you're suddenly making more because, in, you know, they put the price to earnings, how much you were investors were paying for this unit of earnings has increased. So in other words, let's, um, and I'm now going from my memory, but it's all, all this data is in my books and not because I'm trying to sell my books. Sell I, man, I, sell. I, 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 John Wiley and Sons makes more money on my books than I do. So, but really, if you, if you read my the little book of sideways markets, it has all the data there. But like, if you look uh, from 1982 to 2000, bull market. And now, you know, so there's 18 years of 18 years of kind of bull market. The, again, and I'm going from my memory, but the economy grew 6% a year. Dividends were another 2 or 3% to 4%, whatever that number was. But- Let me, let me uh, back up. You said the economy. Again. You're talking about this, the, the earnings on, on, on stocks and, and companies, earn, company growth was 6% a year plus the 4% equals 10%. Yes. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the market did, I forget, 16 or 18%. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by the way, when I say earnings, 
in the long term, earnings and, uh, and GDP were the same number. So in other words, there were times where earnings grew at a faster rate the economy, but then because this prof profit margins went up, but then it usually followed by the years when earnings grew at a slower rate than the economy. So in the long run, revenue growth, which is GDP for the economy, and earnings were the same, you know, the grow that number were identical over a long period of time. Just just to, you know, I'm using this as a shortcut. Anyway, but back to 1982 to Southern market. Okay, uh, again, these uh, stock prices went up 6% a year, another three or 4% of dividends, whatever. Um, but the, I'm sorry, it kind of, um, uh, the return, the stock market returns from 82 to southern were more close to 16, 18%. That six to eight extra percent came because price to earnings went up. So, so the, because price to earnings went from eight times earnings to 30 from 1982 to 2000, therefore the returns that were experienced by average investor over that time period were much greater than usual. So okay. let me let me just back up. Let me just yes. back up. Let, let me let me let me bring this all together for a second here, yeah. okay? Because I yeah. think I think it's a very simple concept, right? Yeah. What, what you're selling saying is that there is a baseline constant um, valuation of stocks that we can kind of throw out there, you know, just generally speaking, right? Over the long term, yeah. And there are times that that pitches and rolls from higher to lower, dependent on a variety of things. Basically, what you're saying is the multiple or the price earnings, but the multiple that people are willing to pay for a stock, the willingness of them to buy a higher price or a lower price changes over time, dependent on a variety of conditions. So far, so good. Yes. Okay. Shallow Hal. You seen the movie? A uh, long time ago. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, the basic premise uh, of the movie is that this one character, he, he, he's, he, he just can't find any girls to date. He has these high expectations and he's looking on the outside only, not on the inside. And it's all about what the looks are and the people are not that good. He, Tony Robbins comes in, puts a spell over him. Now all of a sudden he sees these people with these really good underlying souls and personalities they may be really large in the case of this particular circumstance, but they're but they but they become beautiful in his eyes. So basically, what happens is that sometimes we got a shallow hal experience that happens with stocks. Whereas all of a sudden, maybe these crappy stocks that are looking good or bad or vice versa, it's all in the eyes of the beholder at any given time. Sometimes they look better. Then, then they should. Sometimes they look worse than they should. Is that a basic summation of what you're saying? Yes. Or you can also say that our recent experience uh, tends to shape how we look at stocks. Mm -hmm. When the market kept going, you know, it keeps going higher. We tend to look at them more positive, and therefore expectations are rising, even though they should be declining. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. That. Yeah. So anyway, so the, the here, here, here's, let me get to the punchline. So. Whenever the price to earnings gets to very high level and we receive an extra return that we received in you know, 2000, usually followed by a period when we have to pay, pay it back, mm -hmm. right? Because and this is when the price to earnings starts declining from 30 to less. And that price decline means that instead of making 10% a year from stocks, we are making less. Maybe it's you know, 4, 5, 3% a year because we are paying back for the previous two decades. And that's in the, and so, and basically, well, I would argue today we are kind of on the somewhere close to the pinnacle of this, you know, as well. So, in other words, the stocks when you know, we had this incredible bull market over the last you know twelve years, mm -hmm. right? And the valuations got extremely high, and people could justify that because interest rates got incredibly low, right? Mm -hmm. And the and they and low interest rates, they almost like change the DNA of our behavior. Like we start looking at stocks very differently. We, when interest rates are uh, 1% and is if you're a savior, if you're, if you're saving money, that's not enough for you, you know, to live off the income, you start looking for uh, bond substitutes. And suddenly you start looking at other assets that have income-like characteristics. I'll give you one example. And I, I, I write about, I, I focus on one stock because people can relate to it, mm -hmm. but I have nothing against this company and I still want to be able to uh, visit Atlanta and not, you know. Uh-oh. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about Coke, right? Mm -hmm. But Coke is like, you know, it's a 
146 year old company, you know, nobody, nobody is doubting that Coke is going to be around 20 years from now. And, but in people look at Coke today and they don't look at how much they're paying for the unit of earnings. All they care about that Coca-Cola pays 2.6% dividend. And they know that Coke will be able to raise the dividend over time because it has pricing power, even though the demand for its product is not really increasing. Like it's been stagnating for the last 10, 15 years. Um, so therefore they're paying 30 times earnings for a company that's basically not growing, but people say at least it's paying me 2.6% dividend, which is better than a, uh, than a treasury bond. However, the problem is if, and, and uh, it's not a certainty, but it's, I would say it's high probability now interest rates rise, then, and suddenly, you know, 10-year bond yields 3 4 5%. And that could happen. You know, it's, it, has, it has in the past. And we have a lot more debt now than ever before, and inflation is running much harder than over the last 30 years. Um, then suddenly investors, you know, investors will say, well, the 2.6 plant dividend that Coke pay me is not enough. And suddenly they'll say, well, that 4% treasury yield is much better. Yeah. And is really Coke worth 30 times earnings? Huh. This is a company that's really not growing very much. And so maybe this is a company should be traded at 12 or 13 or 15 times earnings, which is basically 50% lower than where it is today. Okay. And this is the very simple and sane example because you and I can kind of you know, we understand the product. Sure. Yeah. But then that's probably kind of the lowest bar because after that, you start looking at companies which are like technology companies and have innovative product and maybe even disruptive product, but where people are completely not paying attention to what they, you know, they're so mesmerized by earnings growth or by revenue, not even earnings growth, revenue growth, because those companies, a lot of these companies don't have earnings. And they're basically saying, I'm willing to pay any price. And, and, and that kind of makes sense where uh, uh, money has no value because, because, because you know, interest rates are near zero, right? Mm-hmm. Interest rates are higher and suddenly you say, well, if this company is going to make all this money 20 years from now and the interest rates are higher, well, maybe, this com- maybe I should be actually paying attention to what this company is going to make three years from now, which is not very much, or five years from now. And suddenly, this company has declined by fifty or seventy percent, which already happened. If you look at the sure, no, it's, it's a long list, long yeah, list. Yeah, and I, like you know, and it, it's kind of a good summation of that list is if you just look at the portfolio of Keith, you know, of uh, Arc, mm-hmm. and you know, you can see those, you know, those, you know, it's Arc Innovation, right, fund. So yes, those innovation, innovative companies. By the way, a lot of them are very, very interesting businesses, which will have a great. With earnings, by the way, with earnings, with positive earnings. Some of them are. No, no, I must say all of them, but some of them. Yeah, some of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But they just, they are, there's a two levels of thinking. There is a first one is an emotional and second one is um, more thoughtful kind of uh, analytical thinking. So on emotional thinking, those are great companies. And a lot of times, you know, it's very easy to say, like very easy to see this, like Tesla. I could argue it's a great company, right? I, I can argue that PayPal is a great company and MasterCard and Visa and a whole bunch of other ones are great companies. And Andrew, you and I would love to have our kids work for those companies. Sure, right? yeah. But that doesn't make them good stocks. And this, you know, what makes them a good stocks are the returns, expected returns over the next five or 10 years. And expected returns are a function of not just growth, but also how much you pay for the growth. And I think that's what, was missing in the markets over the last five or 10 years, right? And but, I think but, this but, is what we're coming back so to. So what's interesting is coming back, you got to wonder, by the way, at this point, if there are shreds of opportunities in some of these names that fell so far. There has to be. Um, I mean, so let me, there's got to yeah, be a so stock the, in there. There's got to be a few stocks that were just taken to the woodshed with the rest of them. So let me let me just tell you from my experience. Um, so I went through some of the stocks in the Arc, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Kathy Wood stocks. Yep. And we looked at a few of them. I'm just not going to mention names. Just you know, uh, but the and they still have to decline for us 
at least 50% just for them to be mildly attractive. And right. this is not, this is not me like, this is not me looking for, to buy something at three times earnings. Don't get me wrong. This, I understand that those companies are like, I'll give you one example. Just, just, you know, uh, we look at DocuSign and I looked at I DocuSign. Was gonna, that was the one I was going to bring up to DocuSign. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I think it's a phenomenal business and it had a, like I know that it had a tremendous impact on my money management business. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it has in yours as well because it saves a lot of time, et cetera. It's like a whole person. It's like a person. You know, no, it is. And it's a and it's and it's an incredible company. And they underpricing their product to keep competition away. And I've been looking at I've been looking at this company since last last three or four years and studying it, et cetera. And we just talked to the company literally two weeks ago. And it's still at this price, I think your expected return is a very small. Like it's a, you make, make some money, maybe a little bit, but I'm talking about single digits, you know. But, but, but wait, th this also has big assumptions that, that these companies that got away with not providing massive earnings, right? You follow what I'm saying? In other words, they were able to say, to keep on plowing it back in, plowing it back in and giving you some earnings or no earnings for that matter for the point of expansion. It makes the assumption that they're not going to say and realize, well, you know what? Uh, you know, the markets want some earnings here. Maybe what we'll do here is not your price up because once you get involved with DocuSign, to a degree, it's a little bit of a mousetrap, right? It's hard to get out of it. Yeah. Right? Uh, like, like a Salesforce, which is your perfect lobster trap, if you will. Once you're in Salesforce, it's like, it's like, uh, you, it's like monster, what's it called? Gorilla glue. You can't yeah, get out. A, so yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a latent, uh, you know, pricing power. Yeah. They, you know, they can, you know. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and my point though is maybe there is some of that that's going to go on because every incremental amount of, of, of um, overvaluation that you see could be fixed a little bit by their pushing the, uh, the er, you know, just pushing whatever they're doing from marketing a lot into earnings and keeping their current clients. I'm just saying it's possible. You know, I absolutely. And I, you know, listen, I could be proven like in this case, you know, I could be proven to be wrong about this. Right. And it's a, and, and you know, and, and when we, when we model these companies, we never look at them in a linear way. In other words, mm -hmm. it's very important to understand um, that we don't just say, okay, if revenue is growing 20% a year, earnings will grow 20% a year. Well, the there is a fixed cost element of this, and there is a margin expansion element. So, and a, and there is pricing power element of this. That's what you're referring to. Yeah. And therefore, what over a lot of times what happens that the earnings growth ends up being growing much faster than revenue growth because of margin expansion. So right. I'm like, right. and we we modeled it too, and just still could not. I get it. Get, yeah. Into you know, with a margin of, yeah, with a kind of any kind of margin of safety. Again, right. it's a great company, but here's the interesting part. It's a hundred, I don't know, hundred ten dollar stock today. It will still be a great company at sixty dollars. Yeah, no. Okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> There's a difference between a company and investment. I, I get it. I just find that some of these companies in the interim from also a trading standpoint, a little bit more of a, of a, I, I, well, let me ask you this. First of all, we're talking yeah. about Vitaly Katzenelson, known by Forge as the next Benjamin Graham. Do you know they call you that? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm I, I think they. I kidnapped a, a child of the editor, and uh, that's. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, that that praise did not come cheap. So I, I thought. It, uh, <laughs> so uh, let's talk a little bit about all, all the information about how to get in touch with Vitaly and and, his, and and what he writes and all that, and his music selection, which is classical, by the way, uh, is. Um, is uh, over on the Discipline Investor show notes for this episode 751 on the disciplineinvestor.com. I want to talk about what's recently happened this this incredible this incredibly swift markdown of values that kind of if you weren't watching a lot of people between the time they got their December 31st statement and their January 31st which is about to come it's like what what happened there Whereas mm -hmm. we saw this incredible move that all of a sudden people woke up and said, oh, my God, there's a change in dynamic. At least from what the Fed is telling us, they're serious all of a sudden. And, you know, we're getting all this stuff like uh, higher inflation that's the Fed says is sticky because before they said it was transitory. Everybody seems to believe the Fed, which I find incredibly unbelievable due to the fact that they're always wrong. They are the worst economic analysts and they have the worst projections of any body of economists that I've ever encountered. Would you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think let's see. They're not good. How's that? No, 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 that's, that's right. I mean, I think they, 
you know they try but you know, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they try but yeah but they, they, they the track record is not great yeah they're a nice company but not a good stock how's that okay yeah all right that, that's fine <laughs> so the thing is I'm, I'm maybe trying to get on a maybe trying to get on one of the regional boards i don't know see see what we've seen is um the the idea that all of a sudden in january the idea that well you know if interest rates are going to go up even though they haven't really gone up that much already the talk is there the fact that they're going to now jeremy siegel you know, Jeremy Siegel, right? The guy, Jeremy Siegel said that there's going to be seven interest rate hikes for the year. I mean, the guy's outlandish. He always has to be outlandish to get on TV. Loves TV, that little man. There's some people saying three. I'm of the mindset there's a policy mistake being made. We'll go right past that point and ask you, is this all about just inflation, the fear of Powell now, and somehow being seen as a foe rather than a friend to the markets? Or is this something else that's going on? Well, let me just give you the context of what's going on in the economy. We have $30 trillion of debt, the highest level of debt to GDP we had since World War II. The inflation is, oh, oh we're running huge uh, budget deficits, right? Um, uh, and uh, inflation is raising 6 or 7% a year, whatever that number is, right? And if you like, if you look at, let's look, talk about inflation for a second, because it's very important to understand why, like I, when, when Federal Reserve said it's, you know, it's maybe temporary, I actually questioned. Oh, I, I didn't know I questioned, I fought it every single episode. I told me we're full of shit. I'll tell you the truth. Yeah, and, totally and full I, of shit. Yeah. And, and the way I broke it down is very simple. So you had a, you had a temporary factors there, which is true, right? There was, you know, supply disruptions. That's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. But but then then you had a labor factor that for for part uh, for time being it could have been short term we, we didn't know at the time right we, we didn't know because we were paying people not to work if it was temporary you know once once you stop doing it what's going to happen mm -hmm. and to to my surprise I'll be honest uh, that's you know one, you know it's actually became not temporary because a lot of people just left the workforce I guess. Um, but also, but also, when you look at the labor labor factor, it's important to understand. Unlike price of commodities, which go up and then go down, labor labor prices don't do that. They go up and then don't go down. Yes, right? they're because, sticky. They're very sticky. Yeah. So, so my argument there was: once they go up, they you know. So that's a that's a that's a high inflation at least one time. Like you know, at least it's a high increase in price at least one time. Which is going to make it through everything, through cost of you know, through through the economy is going to take some time, and then you. But you also then you have a couple other factors, and this is important to understand. You have the way we behaved as a country, uh, uh, with uh, boring, you know, we're increasing our debt by forty percent in a year and a half. Also, most likely going to result in um, lower dollar, and lower dollar means that the goods we buy outside of the United States are going to cost us more which also means higher commodity prices, meaning higher oil prices and, and higher metal prices, everything else. That's inflationary. But and also the bond market is less likely. And so which means, you know, by the way, that our reserve currency status doesn't mean we're going to stop being a reserve currency. It is going to be a little bit less of a reserve currency. So the money will be allocated away from US dollar. So I should buy Bitcoin. No, it just, uh, <laughs> but that's, you know, that's a different topic, but, but anyway, but the, 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 the point I want to make is this, that, and also, that also means higher interest rates. But like, let me just back you up. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to, I'm going to argue a couple of points here first. Yeah. yeah, please. First, I agree with the transitory thing. I will say something. I've said this before. I'm going to tell you, and I think you're going to agree with me. And if not, by the way, come after me. Okay. I have no problem. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Inflation is always transitory. It all depends on the time frame you're looking at. Make sense? Um, sure. And I think that the idea that they were trying to thread a needle of this inflation being transitory, they screwed up because it made it sound like it was only here for three or four months. The fact is, the other problem with inflation is that once you have inflation, let's say it spikes for, let's just say one year, let's just say one year, okay? And it mm -hmm. comes back down to the normal levels, quote unquote, of 2%. We still uh -huh. are stuck with higher prices that are growing at 2%. It's not like we're going back down. So the higher prices are sticky until you get into inflationary environment, which they're not going to allow. The other thing, though, is what I find fascinating is I do believe that we are peaking out right now. And, and there's a lot of different reasons that my, my research has brought me to say that. But 
the idea that a dollar lower, which is interesting, I've always seen and I've always studied that uh, increasing interest rates raises the value of the dollar, which is what is happening. But at the same time, we are seeing things like commodity prices go up. And I think that's all OPEC plus this, this, this skirmish with Russia and Ukraine and all of that and some concern that I think is overdone majorly in oil. And now when I start hearing Goldman once again talking about $100 oil, scares the crap out of me. Like run for the hills. Yeah. Um, it's kind of interesting. So the, okay, so let's, so you have a couple of things there. So you're talking about, uh, I just want to, because you, you made a couple of good points and I'm going to address all of them. So the stuff is number one. Um, I think the short term, like the your, your point about, you know, how it's all always, I can't say that word, but my, I can't say any word in the English language, but transitory. Like it's very difficult for me to say this. My ex-wife so couldn't say, say the word Mitsubishi. She would say yeah, okay. so, yeah, so I just so transitory, temporary. Let's use the word temporary. No, that's a temporary because I just it breaks my tongue. <laughs> okay, so um, I think the temporary, like what they were trying, the point they were trying to stress is that you had this supply supply chains interruptions. Mm -hmm. They'll mm -hmm. get fixed, and then it's going to come back to normal. Right, but it, but you're right. It's going to rebase to different price levels, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the point you're making. So right. I agree with you there. I think, but th their point was after that it's going to come back to normal, and what we are learning that most likely that no normal meaning like whatever that one percent a year, you know, whatever that mm -hmm. was before. Mm -hmm. Most likely the normal is going to be, and that's what they're admitting to is probably going to be more than that, mm -hmm. and maybe seven percent is too high. But here was the thing: let's say it's three or four percent. Okay, which is actually normal. Actually, we just kind of learned term normal. Okay, the problem is you can't really have ten-year bond yield one point six percent. Right. When you are uh, when your uh, inflation is three, and so the one thing about the dollar, which is important to understand, remember, it's not just the nominal level of interest rates; it's real. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, when let's say your uh, inflation is three percent and your bond yield is one point six your uh, uh, net interest rate, uh, real interest rate is negative 1.4. If, uh, which is, you know, now you start looking around the world and say, okay, what are the real interest rates around the world? And that's what you can, you know, that's how, that's, that's, that's part one. Mm -hmm. No, no, that's how they, but also what's important to understand, you also look at the, how many dollars are in circulation. And if we are spending, like if we are running, uh, uh, if our administration, it doesn't matter which one actually anymore, uh, runs trillions of dollars of budget deficits every year. So whatever year. idiot is in charge, you mean? Yeah, who, whoever, yeah, whoever is in whatever charge. Whatever idiot, no, whatever idiot is in charge. I'm oh, yeah, well, yeah, okay. I'm going to stay with that. Uh, yeah, okay? oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, yeah, let, me, let me just, yeah, let me just, I just, I'm, I'm fine with the quote, I just don't want to be time specific. Uh -huh. I, you know, I just, because I, you know, okay. Uh, uh, so whatever, even idiot is in charge. I'm not saying, Current or present, I mean, current or previous. I'm not, no, I'm not, no, no, I understand. Okay. But um, uh, <laughs> then, then, so it's also, you know, market is always forward looking as well, right? And they're saying, okay, well, yes, this is what it is right now, but they just, you know, they just print another three trillion dollars of, you know, uh, this, you know, overspend by three trillion dollars. Maybe that's an issue. So, anyway, so I think so when I look at inflation, there is a much higher, you know, inflation the new normal inflation most likely going to be higher than uh, than it was uh, you know than it was you know three years ago right and I think right. that's what the bond market is waking up to and that's what Federal Reserve is waking up to and if Federal Reserve did not wake up to it bond market would so it did, you know so, so they they would have looked even worse so I think it, we, uh, for a long time they were able to you know kind of have low interest rates. But we got we got so much debt now, uh, so well, much but, debt. Oh, so oh, much wait, but let me back up. You have so much debt now that it's almost impossible to raise interest rates because we have to keep on servicing that. And that would be very detrimental. Here's my problem with the Fed. First, 
They made a policy mistake by keeping interest rates low for too long back before the pandemic. They tried to raise them a little bit. They didn't really pay down the debt that much or, or extinguish the, the QE that they had at the time, right? They were trying, but it didn't work so well. Then yeah. on top of it, they come in and they just slam down the interest rates. They start buying a ridiculous amount of bonds. They wait too long, another policy mistake, to start uh, either slowing down on the bonds, which they could have done very easily, or to increase interest rates, which they could have done very easily, just one notch a little bit, just for a little sign that, hey, we're watching stuff right here, okay? And then they made another policy mistake just now where they're coming in way too hard during a pandemic that is still going on. You just told me that you just recently, your whole entire family, and you said your extended family, had COVID recently. We're still mm -hmm. in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. To come in that hard when we still have lockdowns in China, ports being closed, supply chain disruptions is asinine. Yeah. Because um. we I'll tell you why. Not that the data doesn't say that we should, because we don't really know what is going to happen right ahead of our noses. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I this, whole, this whole, like, let me tell you this. I, I actually I have a problem with the whole premise. And, uh, and it's, you're not kind of forced into this conversation, but if you kind of think about from a free market perspective a little bit, mm -hmm. the interest rates really like should be set by the market, not some 250 I, bureaucrats. I and agree it, with that. And, and, I agree and, with that. So they, I agree with and that. So they, and therefore, like it's a, and by the way, interest rates is probably one of the most important commodities in the world, right? Because that's, they determine the price of everything, right? right? So we are, you and I are, like almost like we are like Olympic judges trying to like you know and and I put you as a uh, what is it a Russian judge who uh, the figure skating judge who you know who was not very good um anyway so we are we're trying to judge the performance right like right. Of, of, you know and I <laughs> the thing is they like in reality the free market should really be doing the job and it would do so much better job than the whatever Federal Reserve is doing and in the, like and uh and also like when the Federal Reserve was established about a hundred year, hundred plus years ago, its job was basically be the lender of last resort. That's kind of the, its main job and to prevent kind of a run of the banking system and not to be torn us into almost like a command control economy, because that's a, if you think about it, that's exactly what we're doing, right? Because you are, the government is setting the price for interest rates and Federal right, Reserve is right, the government. Right, you know, it's, right, right. It's, it's not, Technically, government, but it is a government. So, um, so yeah. So I'm not even like trying to judge them. I'm I, like that's in, in all honesty. You and I should not be talking about this because it's a waste of time. All right, because, I'm good yeah, with because, that. I'm good with that. I'm sick of it. Yeah, no, because it's a, <laughs> it's a like well, like it's a very it's a there is very little practicality. Like in other words, and and then what? So what you and I should say, okay, this is the rules of the game. And what do we do about this? Okay, so right? let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Yeah, let's Because yeah. you mentioned something. You said that, I, I still stand by anything I said, by the way. But nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I, it doesn't, by the way, it doesn't mean you're right. I'm not, even sure, I'm not sure you're right or wrong. It's just, you yeah, know. Yeah. That's my opinion. Uh, yeah. So my, my, my point here, though, is you, you mentioned something. I think is really, really, really important. And that is that interest rates determine the price. Now let's take that down to stocks because we know what you do discount models on a variety of things to come out with valuations, valuations as a more value oriented, as a more, uh, I would say uh, practical sense of looking at what is the, I'm going to not say value, but I'm going to use a different word. It's the same word. I'm going to use it in a different way. What is the proper valuation in your opinion of this stock different than value, right? Um, mm -hmm. How do you, when you use interest rates, what, what, how do you re-rate values now with the perception or the idea that there's going to be higher rates moving forward? Okay. So if you think about the, it's, it's actually a very, very good question. Um, if you think about when you value a company, just uh, visualize this. Okay. Let me just, let me just, actually, I'm going to, like, this is. It's I'm closing my eyes. I'm right. closing my eyes. I'm visualizing. Okay. All right. You're yes, a farmer. I'm ready. I'm ready. You're a farmer. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Farmer. You're going to go, you're going to go buy a cow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this cow over the next five years, and I know nothing about farming. Okay. But, uh, or, or raising cows. Uh, but, you know, but it's going to produce, give you so much milk over the next 10 years. Right. And then at the end of 10 years, you're going to, because you're a good guy and you're a Jewish farmer, by the way, it's kind of, Andrew, just let me, well, yeah. in my book, 
I had a chapter about Tevi the Milkman, ah, Jewish yeah, from ah. the Fiddler on the Roof, buying a cow. Uh-huh. You and I are both Jewish, so you can I both relate to this from yes, this. Yes, of course. This way. Anyway, so this is a literally chapter from my book. But anyway, so you go and buy a cow. This cow is going to give you so much milk, right? So you have quantity times price, which is how much, you know, what's going to be the price of the milk. And then 10 years out, you're going to sell the cow for, to a petting zoo because you're a nice man. And you're going to get so much money for that cow. Uh-huh. That's basically the cash flows you're going to receive. Okay, we're going to get the rates for a sec, you know, in a second. But what's important to understand, the quantity doesn't, you know, let's say I assume the quantity doesn't change. The amount of milk it produces and the amount of milk you sell does not change. But one thing high interest rates will do, um, you know, that when you have high interest rates, it means probably you have high inflation. So when I'm analyzing companies or cows, that means that if you are able to raise, if, if you want companies that can raise prices, with inflation or higher, then it means that your revenues will also go up, right? Mm-hmm. The tricky part here, you want to make sure that when that you when you when you own a company that when the raise prices, demand declines, then you have, you know, then okay, then your revenues may actually not go up, right? Mm-hmm. So this is gonna be I'm just giving you kind of specific company by company analysis. Right. So you have to look, okay, so what's gonna to happen to uh, to quantity? Uh, of goods sold, also the you know, ability to raise prices of inflation. So, and then, yes, you have to assume higher discount rate. We don't have to do this right now because our, our discount rates have not changed over the last ten years. We assume, you know, because we we you know we always start with ten percent discount rate, and because we always started the last 10, 15 years because we never knew when this you know when this temporary but we thought low interest rates will change and uh, and they you know and and they, and, they, and they start going higher so but if you're using a 3 or 5% discount rate yes you and a lot of people did then they have to start raising them and that means a lot of the uh no matter what you do a lot of the your the uh the value of the assets declines it's just 10%. I mean, a lot of people are using a risk-free rate as the discount rate, right? And they're yeah. utilizing, they're utilizing oftentimes, and that's where some of these valuations got absurd, was like a 10-year. Yes. So, I mean, uh, you're talking about a 1% versus a 10%. That's that's huge amount of differential in value. Yeah, I mean, so we, that, if, if we're looking at a stock and, and you use the same exact numbers I use and we just go, okay, 10% di- a discount factor and I use 2%, we're talking about a very large difference in valuation. So, so here's the difference. If you were doing this over the last 10 years, you would have made more money than I had. But no, I, of course, of course no, no, you no, would no, have. Right? Because, you know, and, uh, and, and I think that is actually, and because you, either you were, you know, and I'm not you in this case, but, you know, you were either lucky or you, you had this, imp, you know, perfect crystal ball where interest rates are going to be, right? Mm-hmm. If you had any semblance of conservatism or just saying the words, I don't know, and I'm going to, I don't know how the world is going to look, and I'm going to err on the side of caution, you know, that the music will stop at some point, and I don't want to, uh, you know, I, and I basically don't want to be caught with my pants down, right? Kind of thing, um, then you would have been using 10% discount rate. And then, you know, you would have made less money, but at some point you're probably going to be proven right. In the sense, you're going to, you know, you're not going to have this, like if you own ARC, you know, investments. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's kind of thing, yeah. A couple of things. In the United States, in the United States, in America, in the United States here, um, I, when the music stops, we we, we don't get it. We, we, we don't have a chair to sit in. Now in Russia, obviously, when the music stops, your pants are down. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. I just That's made, an interesting maybe, game you play. I'm just so I, I want to mention I, that to I, everybody I, to clarify that. You know, I'm just I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I. You know what? The, I sometimes I mix up analogies. They become more interesting. That's, that's yeah, you know, that much more interesting. Let's yeah. talk about. Um, I think you've talked to me about IBM in the past. For example, we've talked about yeah. that stock. What's your thoughts on that? Because it's, it seems to be a value that keeps on getting cheaper. Oh, so just, okay, so let me just, uh, there is a difference between value stocks and value traps. Yep. And uh, sometimes they're confused. So, um, no, I think the IBM is a company 
uh, like, so I never, like, I haven't never owned a stock. No, it's not true. I think I might've owned it maybe 15 years ago or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, for about a year or something. Yeah. No, but I, um, no, it's a, it's a company that has a hard time. Um, okay. So the, uh, it's kind of interesting. It's a very Russian stock, Soviet stock. Let me tell you why. Because 10, 10 years ago, they had a five-year plan to have. No, oh, I remember this. Uh, when you, I forget the number. Like they said, yeah, yeah. earnings of twenty dollars. I forget the number. Okay, okay. And because they have five year plan, all they were focusing on is manufacturing that twenty dollars of earnings. Um, and, and the problem is when you do that, you end up uh, sacrificing uh, other. You, know, you end up being very short term oriented and giving up long term. Okay, and the got very close to manufacturing, you know, the 20, you know, 20 dollars of earnings. And then, but then they, they had invested in R&D. The culture was already stagnant, you know, kind of very stagnating because of the past glory. Mm. And they were competing against companies who, like Amazon, you know, like, so the, when, where IBM was, uh, was focusing on their current quarter on the next quarter, mm-hmm. they, um, they were competing against company like Amazon where Jeff Bezos, when um, when he was congratulated on his recent quarter, he said, to be honest, the result of this quarter were set, you know, were kind of put in motion three years ago. And, you know, so we are just focusing on a quarter three years from now or five years from now. Right, and I'm right. paraphrasing him. So the point is to achieve a lot of times, um, and this is what's kind of the, if, you know, Amazon is a phenomenal company for good reason because they are willing to give up short-term profitability for long-term success. Mm -hmm. Okay. And IBM was kind of the inverse of that. So as a value investor, it's important to understand the difference. And also um, the value investors, value investors often, you know, or or value investing often associated with a kind of this hard numbers. Okay, you are a value investor if you own stocks that trade at 10 times earnings or five times earnings, right? And those are hard numbers, easier to identify. And my eight-year-old daughter who can count to 20 or, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm sure she could count to more than that. She could be a great investor because all she needs to know is less than 10 buy, more than 10 don't buy, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what value investing is. Value investing is also looking at the softer side and looking at the culture. And, and, and this is, to be honest, this is where I spend like two thirds of my time now, not just like the numbers, but looking at the uh, company's culture, looking at the strategy. And uh, so if you look at my portfolio, it will have companies would look like IBM, not IBM, but will have a quantitatively cheap. Uh, but it will also have companies that look like docu signs, like companies where they may not look quantitatively cheap, but we are very confident that we have a margin of safety and the company is, is mispriced on what it's going to earn three to five years out. Right. So I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but no, I no, just. No, no, it is. It's, 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 it's one way to answer a question, right? The, the, uh, that question. It, it, there's multitude of ways that, you know, people looked at things, you know, they tried to place value on Tesla for years, you know, or, but again, that's their answer of what it is. So I yeah. think. You know, at imausa.com, where you have custom stress-tested portfolios, this is some of the stuff that you do on a regular basis. So I think that people should go check that out uh, and and find out more about it. We're out of time here. But Vitaly, as always, a wonderful time spending time with you and getting to know more about what you see in the economy and what's happening and having our repartee where we can go back and forth and challenge each other on a variety of topics related to investments. So I think that was a... A good run right there. A good uh, discussion, I think, brought in uh, our, our listeners a lot of good information. Andrew, can I mention one little thing? Yes, sure. Uh, I have a podcast. It's a kind of, it's a poor man's podcast because you have a true podcast. My, my podcast. <laughs> what is a poor man's podcast? Well, what does that, that even mean? No, let me explain what I mean. Because you have a like, guest, your host, and you invest a lot of time and energy. My podcast is basically my articles read to you by somebody, not me. And thank me for that. Um and uh, just just my articles that kind of uh, yeah, I've listened to them. I listened to them by the way. They're very good. 
Yeah, so that's that's a poor man's podcast. So uh, that's a and it's you can find it on a either investor.fm like FM radio, or if you just look uh, look for intellectual investor podcast. Very similar to your name, by the way, Intellectual Investor Podcast. Yeah. Your podcast. So I was thinking about doing, so, you know, the name of this podcast is The Disciplined Investor. Some people yeah. have asked me to do a food podcast because, you know, I'm a foodie and I, and I kind of, oh. a lot of, yeah, no. you know what I would name it, I think? Uh. The Disciplined Ingester. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could you could do the whole brand extension. Yeah, you know, exactly. Like, it just it's, keeps it's on going round and round in circles. Very good. Yeah. Vitaly yeah. Katzenelson, I want to thank you again. Very uh, very uh, good wishes to health to your family and your extended family. And uh, we'll talk soon, buddy. Thank you, Andrew. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. Nothing discussed in this podcast should be considered a recommendation to buy or sell any security. Past performance is no indication of future results. In addition, the information presented is not intended to be used as a sole basis of any investment decisions, nor should be construed as advice designed to meet the individual needs of any particular investor. Nothing herein constitutes legal, accounting, or tax advice, or individually tailored investment advice. Remember, investing involves substantial risk. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results and a loss of original capital may occur. No one receiving or accessing this information should make any investment decision without first consulting his or her own personal financial advisor and conducting his or her own research and due diligence, including carefully reviewing any applicable prospectuses, press releases, reports, and other public filings of the issuer of any securities being considered. Please consider this for educational purposes only. As always, use your best judgment when investing. Horowitz & Company, Inc. is registered as an investment advisor with the state of Florida, and conducts business in other states where it is properly registered or is excluded from registration requirements. Registration does not imply any level of skill or training. Advertisements are not related to the host or affiliates and are not considered recommendations by the host of the show or any affiliates of Horowitz & Company. If you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy Vitaly's 2021 Almanac, a collection of his best articles from 2021 packaged together with some art for a pleasant read. To download a free copy, visit contrarianedge.com almanac. To listen to more episodes, visit investor.fm. Enjoy life and prosper.